Are you or have you ever been in an abusive relationship? Have you ever experienced workplace drama? Have you experienced workplace trauma? Do you think you've been experiencing or have you ever had racialized experiences at work? What was the impact? I'm gonna read an excerpt from Minda Hart's Right Within. One of my favorite sermons I like to listen to on repeat is Radical Expectations by Sarah Jakes Roberts. Every time I listen to it, I gain a new understanding of God's expectations of me as I walk through my healing journey. Recently, what stood out to me was the line, change your expectations of this moment. Roberts went on to say that, yes, you might have experienced trauma, but it doesn't mean that you have to expect trauma in your new experience. Of course, when she said it, I immediately thought of the workplace. Just because we have experienced racialized trauma at work doesn't mean that we have to expect racialized trauma at every employer after. We can change the expectations of our work environment at any time. And because we can change the expectations of our work environment at any time, many of you may know that's been something that I've been working on for about the past year. And the reason I really took time to focus on that was so I could really expand upon all the ideas and things that I have been working on for the last 35 years. And uh, happily, this fall, I had the pleasure of connecting with and meeting this beautiful human being right here. So for those of you who do not know, this is Alyssa Stamp. And she is my co-founder and business partner in our think tank and professional services company, which is called the Center for Intercultural Business Alliances. And today we're here specifically to talk about what does it mean when you're talking about accountability in action and specifically equity work because we believe that equity work takes real work and that it's not about being good or nice, that it's really about accountability in action. So we're gonna talk about what does that mean? And when you think about you know, coming together across age, um, across ethnicity, across uh, you know, backgrounds, across experience, faith backgrounds, you know, there are always challenges, right? When you think about how do people work together and how do people cooperate? But we met in September, we clicked, we launched a podcast, we launched a business. And what we really want to share is what does that actually look like? What does it look like working together? So I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa to get started so I can get the dog to stop barking for a second and then we'll take it from there. So it looks like a lot of conversations, a lot of perspective, a lot of gut checks, and a lot of listening to Vonda. I know that I do not understand the lens with which she walks through the world. And I know that I am more advantaged and more privileged. So it's about showing up and deferring too, because she's going to set the pace. We've built a really strong relationship that's built on mentorship and listening to each other and trust. And that requires showing up every day. And so with that being said, um, you know, the thing is, everybody has to, at some level, begin to start by operating in facts, right? And really thinking about what we as an individual person, where we come from, right? What we've done, what we've experienced. And I think a big part of that is really looking at um, our own, even to, you know, what Minda talks about, right? making sure that we're doing that check about what is right within. So something that you and I have been talking about lately is that for me, as a black woman who spent 32, 33 years in corporate America, I have a lot, <laughs> a lot of racial trauma, right? Um, and when you think about it, um, specifically in the corporate setting, right, it's occurred over a long period of time. So it wasn't like, you know, oh, it had some one thing happened 20 years ago in a job and this and that. Because the bottom line is I've been groped at work. I've been grabbed. I've been pushed. I've been shoved. I've been, you know, assaulted. I've been under leveled, underpaid, under resourced all the times I was a manager. So I've had a lot of it. So for me, when I, you know, had this 
um, vision around, you know, partnering with different people, um, I really wanted to happily wait and find a person like you, right? Somebody where we have the same thought process around learning, around exploring, right? Who we are as people to begin to be then begin to be able to grow, right? And to flourish. And so I think that, um, you know, one of the things that really makes us compatible in how we work together is really because we've been having this conversation around accountability. So when you're talking about building a relationship and we're talking about what it looks like when you are relating across culture, because I believe and you believe and we've talked about it, is that anything, everything is not about race. Because race is, we know, this construct, right, that has been um, put upon us, right, by capitalism. We all know that. But, you know, the bottom line is that our differences are around culture and the culture at which we were brought up. So you and I, you know, we launched this podcast yesterday and you know we've been having a lot of conversations around black culture and white culture and you know we've been having other com conversations around different faith cultures right what's the yeah. baptist culture in the black community look like versus a white household very different we learned right yeah. and so our approach and what we've been talking about for months has been that intercultural approach so how would you sort of describe that you know in terms of thinking about what an intercultural, you know, approach um, looks like in terms of, you know, the Center for Interracial, um, for Intercultural Business Alliances. Well, we don't just look at race, like Bonda said. It takes into account every part of you that is different or common, whatever that looks like, and how you show up into the world and build the program around you. We made the conscious decision not to put women in the title for Intercultural Alliance because everything is in business is gendered and assumptive. And it's based, this alliance that we're building is based off of the fact that women can be the norm or the standard or the game changer. And when we talk about culture, I mean, we even had a conversation, what was it last night? And we realized that we had completely different definitions for a word, it was backpedal. Yes. Yes. Oh my God, that was so interesting. Okay, let's talk about that. Here. How did we get on the conversation of backpedaling? Was it what was it a, a something we were watching on television? And I think I said, you know, a person that backpedals, uh, the way I use the term is that they are going backwards, they're traveling in reverse. So maybe they started to do something or started to say something, but then they pedaled back. So if you think about like the pedal on a um an old school bicycle where you right, um right. you know can break when you pedal back, so it's like er, like. Uh, shift your brakes. But when you were saying about pedal back, what did you mean? It was more about a commitment for me. So like if someone made a commitment and then like backpedaled, they like stopped making that commitment is essentially what it meant. So even just within American culture in two different people from two different generations in two different parts of the country, one word can have significant impact if you're making assumptions about something. So our goal is to find out the leader that is within you and help you carve a path that matches that so you can strategize before you soar. Yeah. And so if you think about, right, asking people, you know, about when was the last time they really had, you know, an impactful conversation, right, about culture and change in an authentic way, how were those conversations held, right? How was space held for those conversations? And what were people allowed and free to say? So for example, right, you and I have conversations, like we'll be working on a, um, you know, a presentation deck, right? Or we were working on design ideas, right? Or we were working on um, the new logo, right? And things like that. So what happens or describe like, you know, if you come up with something like you came up with this beautiful, you know, red and gray based on, you know, our colors and this and that. Describe kind of like what this process is like, because I think and you can tell me there have probably been times and I can think about times. And Minda had a couple of examples in the book that brought them to mind of, you know, being in a work situation where I'm trying to give an opinion or say, hey, you know, I really strongly think this is a really good direction only because I have experience in that and I've been doing it forever. 
or hey, this work is directly in my lane, right? So most people who know me know, um, if they've known me for any length of time, that I am a digital change leadership expert. That is my job. I've been doing change management since I was 15 years old. So if somebody is talking to me and they say, hey, Vonda, I want your opinion about some stuff around digital transformation, right? Like the work I do on digital workplace or, or whatever, right? Then I'm going to give the information, right? I'm going to give my expertise. Um, and I'm going to expect that if you ask me for my information or you ask me for my expertise, that you're asking me because you value it and you want to utilize it. But what does that look like in situations? Because I can think of, you know, in corporate settings where I've been in those situations when it's like I keep on giving a suggestion and it doesn't work. And, you know, the thing that's coming to my mind and I have to do this for the audience because I've been, you know, showing my my new partner here some comedy. And we were watching Cat Williams the other day and he was, you know, using the uh, the analogy of the, the tiger, you know, and he said, you know, <laughs> You know, he was talking about trying stuff, right? And he was saying, you know, black people, we know how that go, right? Sometimes we be trying stuff and trying stuff. Don't work. Trying stuff, trying stuff, right? And trying stuff and trying stuff. So I've been in situations throughout my 30-something plus years in, in, in corporate America where I'm trying something and trying something. It don't work. I'm trying something and trying something. Don't work. So in 2020, what did I do? I said, oh, I'm trying something different because what I'm trying and trying is not working in a corporate setting. Right. So now, hey, I'm out here on my own. I'm in these streets. As my friends know, I like to say I'm in the streets, right? Meaning um, running my own business and doing my own thing. So what I want to talk a little bit about is what is the dynamic and, and what is that like? And even in your corporate career, yep. right, even in MBA school, because I know you had to work in groups where those groups were mixed people across age, across gender, you know, background. Talk a little bit about what is that like from the perspective of a person that's grown up in white culture yeah. or a white person that's trying to really, you know, um, navigate, right, in a new world or a changing world where they're working with someone that they're not used to. Yeah, there's a lot there and I'll try to get it all. So catch me if I miss something. Um, but I can easily say this is the best group project I've ever been a part of. And I am not playing that up for the camera because both of us show up and actually do the work. Um, and that's something that was obviously missing from a lot of like my business school interactions, but then a lot of corporate culture. But to your point about like, how does it feel or what does it feel like when you are being asked something and it's not going anywhere. It's incredibly frustrating. And at some point you just stop talking because mm -hmm. you're like, if you're not going to hear me, if you're not going to listen to me, then why am I even going to say anything? And it's those moments, while they may seem pretty benign, that you carry with you through the course of your life. And so if you are in a new group, say, and making a change and you're making suggestions and they're not being heard or they're being consistently ignored or you're asking for things and it's just not happening, what choice do you have but to make the change, I guess right. is what you're saying. Right. So then I guess the other question is really, um, you know, how people think about standing up for yourself in those situations because mm -hmm. in a corporate setting, right, and you've worked in corporate just like I have and, and many people who are going to see this, and whether you, when, when we say corporate, you know, whether we're talking about academia, sure. you know, or finance or, you know, um, insurance or tech, it doesn't matter. White collar. White collar jobs, whatever, right? When you think about the context of power, mm -hmm. right, that is wielded over you. So if you think about trauma, right, and trauma is more described as, you know, things that happen repeatedly, right? And racialized trauma, you know, we use a word that I hate and, you know, it's, to me, it's like a bad word, that word microaggression, mm -hmm. because there's no such thing. It's actual assault. It feels it's an assault. Like, yeah. Right. So it's not it's an assault. Right. Because if you assault a person, there's nothing micro about that. Exactly. Right. So if you, somebody stabbed a person, you're going to call is that was a micro assault. No, no, it was not. It was a it was an assault. Right. So when I think about the micro aggressions that people use as a terminology ongoing and you think about you know how many times does a person stick up and stand up for themselves so they say hey right i'm going to make a different choice so when you transform um into a private you know sort of a um situation right where you're working for yourselves and you're partnering there's really never any need to stand up 
I mean, not ne never any need to 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 have to stand for it, right? right. There's not a need to have to stand for it, get right? Because right. you're not going to get fired. So, but the thing is, right? Healing from racial trauma it takes a minute, but it also takes right a, a community, and it takes partnerships, right? And it takes having that recognition that how because you and I we wouldn't be able to work together if you didn't know I was healing from trauma right, right? and same here on right. my side yeah absolutely so man I don't even know where you want me to start because I could start in so many places wherever you but, want but basically no white supremacy here yeah you say what you want <laughs> um actually that's a good point because the other thing that you were talking about last night that I think was so key is something that I carry with me from like my corporate culture and the trauma that I still have from it and this is something you don't even think about until you either get outside of it or have a moment to break and pause and think um, but Vonda was making a comment about how she asked somebody to do something for her and they do it, didn't do it exactly the way that she thought they should do it. But she goes, you know what? I wasn't specific about it and she still got the job done. And I think that's something that's part of my corporate conditioning as well, where the blame is always put on somebody that's further down on the hierarchy or somebody that's not like wielding the power as you were saying. And so when something doesn't go according to plan, who's going to get the blame. And so I felt that deeply when you were talking about that, because in many of the situations I've been in where I felt out of control and lost and like I was about to spiral and go through something traumatic was a moment where I was both given the power, but nothing to do with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in my standpoint, I think, I think things I've seen and I know that people who work, especially people who work for large corporations that have smaller uh, percentages of black employees um have been used in props mm -hmm. right or used in pictures or been you know been like oh well we'll give, give all the black people a ticket to go to a conference you know blah 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 you know what and so if February's coming, coming up <laughs> right and so you know just just thinking about those different circumstances that people find themselves in but but to me right the bottom line is you know we all have a story right we all have a solution. So ideas, thoughts, plans, right? And we all have a, a style or a swagger or a way that we wanna bring those things to bear, right? And so for me, if I don't have to um, depend on, you know, some entity or a person, right, for my livelihood or, um, or for my life, right, then I don't have to be bullied. I don't have to succumb just to the expectations of me just because these are things that white supremacy tells us, right? White supremacist conditioning or white supremacist delusion, right? Which is everything has to be done a certain a way. way right? So if you tell me, hey, Vonda, you know, I want to start a think tank and I say, okay, let's do it. And you say, well, we only can do these three things. And I said, well, hey, Alyssa, I think we should do these two things. And he's like, well, no, because this is the think tank way. Well, no. And so I'm so honored and excited to talk about our think tank, right? And to talk about, you know, accountability and action and to talk about, you know, what we are really doing and who are we inviting in, right? So who are we inviting in? <laughs> <laughs> well, the short answer is leaders, um, but that could be somebody that's an emerging leader, maybe somebody that's towards the beginning of their career all the way up to, you know, the C-suite. And they've been here in corporate America as long as you have. What we're really trying to do is engage with people and meet them where they are and give them the roadmap and the toolkit to get them to the next level, to actually make the changes in their corporate culture, which is a big piece of something that I care about as well. So what we've done is we've merged my care of culture and Vonda's care of change, and we're focusing on culture change within the, the person first, but also as we come together as business leaders and business professionals. So there's four different offerings that we focus on, but the whole goal within each of them is to align, adapt, and then accelerate. I think in today's business world, it's so easy to go straight to go without taking stock, not just of what it is that you're doing, but who you are and how you wanna show up in that project. And so I think that you know what is so cool about you know, this work that we're going to be doing together is not only that, you know, we're on a path, right? Because we just met in September, um, right? And we was like, okay, let's get some legal agreements in place. <laughs> I don't know you like that, right? So we just met in September, right? But we have 
have really felt connected because we've been able to really share and listen to each other and get to know each other. And I mean, I respect the hell out of you for Likewise. taking a chance, you know, and, 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 you know, it's not easy for white women, um, non-black women, um, non-black people <laughs> to listen to white, to black women. Right. And I think about that quote, of, you know, from um, Malcolm X talking about, you know, um, the most, uh, disrespected, per, you know, unrespected, unprotected person in America is a black woman, right? I mean, and and that experience transcends work and other things, and we know it transcends all of the markers and all of the, um, you know, uh, statistics, right? Around socioeconomic markers, around health markers, and you know. Um, so it's it's really important, right, that any time you're in that thing, it, you know, in that relationship that you're thinking about that. So, you know, we have thought through, you know, if you're talking, going through what is the framework, right, around aligning, you know, who you are and making sure that you are, <laughs> to Minda's point, like right within. Yes. Because how are you really going to develop relationships? How are you really going to lead people? How are you going to build, you know, large groups and organizations and teams, right, if you don't know who you are? So we believe that all leaders, regardless of whether you've been a leader for two years, two minutes, 20 years or 50 years, that your skills, your strategies could use some levels of refinement. So you're already gonna bring to the table what you have, right? So in the industry doesn't matter, but those special skills, right? Those savvy steps and those really specifically sound, you know, strategies that are tied directly into your background is really what's important, right? Yep. We are going to also really be focusing on doing these private symposiums. Um, and those will be specifically for leaders who say, okay, well, I have a team of 10 or I have a team right. of 12 where I really want to bring these people in and we want to be on the same page when it comes to culture, when it comes to change. And the reason that those two, right, the refining of the individual leadership and the, you know, um, building out of deeper skills through these symposiums, the reason that is going to be so powerful is because of all the data and the information and the curation that's happening behind the scenes, right? So, you know, using the team to have put together these, you know, forms and, and these things to be able to gather this information is really going to be the thing. So talk a little bit about, you know, um, what the, the, the launching the leader's legacy actually looks like, right? When we think about, you know, having people um, connect to, you know, connect with us and to really become a part of the, of the, of the center. Well, I can't go into specific detail because everything is going to be tailored to you as the individual. So right. that's the part that's really going to be able to set this apart from something else that you might see in the marketplace. Um, and I want to talk about something that you referenced because you were saying navigating through change. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the great resignation, the fact that we have a pandemic. I mean, how many outside forces do we need to have before we recognize that we're all kind of navigating through something really difficult? right now, and it might require more of us in this moment than autopilot. And so that's what we're really doing, is we're taking you from the part where you've hit autopilot and you've just been doing it for five, 10, 15 years, because that was me before I did my work, and then moving it to the place where, okay, I know who I am now as a leader and I can set a boundary here, or I can do this, or I can call on someone in my team to do this and actually get comfortable delegating. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different facets that can go into it. Um, and you hit on private symposiums, which again will be uh, curated to that organization or that group. But I know you specifically want to talk about um, the public symposiums that we have because you have a really special announcement to make. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I um, am super excited. I was hoping to have this uh, finalized, um, you know, for. Um, Martin Luther King Day, but I don't know, I guess in my, uh, I don't know, excitement to kind of be out of corporate America, I forgot that people don't work on Martin Luther King Day. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was trying to um, really uh, make some uh, progress on being able to announce our um, first public symposium, um, which is going to be uh, February 15th and 16th. Yep. And so we're super excited that for our 
Black History Month um, celebration. We have four brilliant Black women, um, two current best-selling authors, an upcoming best-selling author, as well as um, a CEO founder and brand ambassador. So I'm super excited that we're going to have Francine Parham, Jackie Abram, Don Christian, and Angel G. Henry um, throughout our two-day symposium. And we're going to start at 8.30 in the morning. Each session is going to be a power session of 25 minutes, and you'll have 15 minutes in between to connect with people one-on-one um, -on -one and in small groups using, using a platform called Gather. And we're going to have full recordings available. Um, and so, you know, it's when you think about, you know, really – giving businesses right business leaders specific tools right because that's what it's about right because there's all kinds of tools out here whether you're talking about tools to help people you know really um address and and um move uh the needle i guess if you will on different challenges that they're having regarding culture and change because that's really what it is right because if you want to talk about why people are resigning right those things it's not just black women are resigning just mothers are resigning just millennials are resigning it's not it's people are fed up right and and it's really looking at what type of culture right do you have within your organization right and is that culture going to keep the people there right so if you have um a command and control culture that people don't really want to um you know be a part of it's going to be more difficult and more challenging and so helping you know um have those tools and especially you know from the experts that we have right so francine her whole background is career advancement and she's been working with c-suite you know executive level um uh people um you know especially in the chief people officer space you know um chief uh, financial officers, um, CEOs, she's been doing that her entire career and specifically coaching um, black and women and women of color and women on career advancement strategies. Like that's like her, like that's her thing, right? Um, and so she's going to be talking to these leaders about, okay, okay, you know, Mr. CIO, here's some things you need to think about from a sponsorship program, because it's your job, right, to really help propel and advance women's careers within your company. Otherwise, to your point, they are going to leave, right? Yeah. And so when you think about, you know, the resources and the folks that we're going to be, um, you know, partnering with, um, those who are going to be joining, um, you know, the center, I mean, I'm just, you know, overly um, excited and, you know, they're going to have access to all these speakers, to the authors, to the artists, right? And to leaders in this environment that's really going to nurture, nurture that, right? And then, you know, the final thing that we're going to be doing, which I think is just, you know, it, it's, it's next level. And so, you know, talk about these intercultural alliances and, and even how this is phase one, mm -hmm. right? So introduce that. Yeah, so we already read the tagline for Intercultural Alliances, and it's a space for women. And I put the X in women here because we're including people that are feminine presenting or that um, or, or trans women or non-binary folks. So Intercultural Alliances is a space where, as Vonda says, we're exploring intersections of faith, age, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and ability. It's not just one aspect of who you are. It's intersectional. Um, and we've already, so I think this is what you've alluded to, we've already had international interests in what we've been doing. So it's not just going to be located here in the U.S., but we've already started plans to expand to Europe and beyond, which I think would be really cool to build a network of really powerful, creative, intelligent professionals and leaders, um, specifically women as, as it pertains to this. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I'm just really excited to be on this journey, right? And, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, would be helpful is to maybe talk about, you know, um, what fears or struggles or, you know, things that we're anticipating. You know, I think for me, I think definitely taking that leap to, you know, leave corporate America, um, you know, in December of 2021, you know, I think that was um, 
probably anxiety producing. Um, but, you know, it's something that I've been wanting to do for years. And, you know, I just needed to get my kind of, you know, roadmap figured out. And so now, you know, every time I think about the type of employee that I was, right, when I was given 299%, right, to every, every employer and staying up late and coming in early and, you know, flying here and flying there and taking on all these projects and taking on this work. And I said, well, I should be doing that for myself, but I should be doing it in a way that's living with my values, right? And I should be doing that in a way that aligns with the person who I am. And so what I know for myself is that moving forward, right, that we want to try to get as many people involved in CFIBA. Um, and so it may be, you know, anxiety producing. It may be, I don't know, scary. We might get stressed out at times. But, you know, I'm on for the ride and I'm excited to do it with you. So tell me what you think, you know, about what this journey looks like. And, and you know, take your time. And I want you to also talk about, you know, if you were, I don't want to say making a, a recommendation necessarily, <laughs> but if you were sharing, you know, with another um, white woman about your journey so far, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, sort of close us out with that a little bit and talk about, you know, what this experience was like, what are you expecting and what are you right. looking forward to? Well, you and I have been on our journey since September, as you mentioned. And for me, that journey has been... I feel like I've known you a decade <laughs> or longer because we've had that many conversations. And when we're not talking, we're sending each other voice memos. And uh, my husband can definitely attest to that. So it's it's been beautiful. And I will say it's been more meaningful than most of the relationships I've had because we have to show up every day. It is a choice. It's not a relationship out of convenience for us. It's a relationship forged in our shared past but also our shared future, which is what we've created here. So um, if I'm making a recommendation to white women, it's like get out of your heads, work on yourself, and um, start the journey, start the process, launch your leadership legacy, as, we, as we've alluded to and as we keep saying. But if we want to talk about fears and anxieties, because I know that we all have those, and like I'm not <laughs> immune to that also, we both came off of, pretty traumatic corporate workplace um, environments before we came to the decision to leave corporate America and do what we're doing now. And so all of those still remain. Like when you talked about like doing something and then you didn't give specifics, so you weren't going to get mad about it. My goodness, that, that triggers a few things for me too. So there's ways that that will always show up, but you are worth the journey that it takes to get there to, to heal, to start to heal. And you are worth the time that it takes to put in the work and the effort. I think if I've learned anything over the course of just this past six months, it's that the people that hold you show you in their actions, not just their words. Um, so that's something that we're doing specifically with CFIBA. We're holding you in action and in words. We have so much more to announce with this and so many more things to come. So please do pay attention. Um, and uh, I, for me, that's my piece is like, show up, do the work. I love that. I love that. So, um, yeah. And I think that's what it is. It's about showing up and do the work. And I love, you know, Chris, thank you so much for your question. You know, how do we stop the harm, right? We have to share the stories. And, you know, that's one of the things I'm so grateful, you know, um, about this network of people that I've built. I'm super grateful to, um, you know, Zach Nunn and Living Corporate. You know, um, you know, I have, uh, we have three shows now, you know, um, Radical Change, Radical Equity, um, Radical Power, which is where we're really talking and telling these stories of trauma and speaking truth. And the other thing is go to our podcast, Opposites Oppressed dot com um the opposites of press the podcast because we're talking these stories we're talking about these stories of trauma and truth and really right when you think about how do you get to a solution it's about accountability yes. so if you are the white person let's say who has wielded white supremacy or who has made some mistakes or who has questions right how can you show up for yourself 
um, in that moment of uncertainty or in that moment of fear? How can you show up for yourself and really, you know, um, drive I, my tagline but radical change but how do you really how do you really do that and you know just close us out with that yeah so i think i think the misunderstanding with something like this is that the work has to be external and not internal mm, say more about that i think it's easy to if you feel like you've damaged or hurt someone to immediately reach out and then try to reconcile and do whatever you can to fix the situation i think that's a very normal or like common reaction would probably be the better way to put mm -hmm. it, very common reaction. But especially in the terms of racial trauma, I think it's important that as a white body person, that's my moment to reflect and to learn what I what maybe I didn't know before and do the work on my own. Because in what I've read and what I've known is that sometimes bringing it back up, sometimes bringing it to the forefront and trying to rehash it and trying to process it with you is more traumatizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's work that I have to do on my own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, would you mm -hmm. agree? I would agree. And I think one of the things, you know, that and we talk about this and we talked about this on one of the episodes of um, of uh, Radical Change, where we talked about, you know, um, having these conversations in a space where you feel OK and where you feel comfortable. But that really starts from a position of trust. But it also, like you said, your own work. So, you know, it's key to know um, where you are in your work. And maybe that is like, you know, something to help people think about. So we talk about, you know, in relationships um, and connecting. And I think that's key. So, right. Chris says, you know, in a relationship, you can connect around cleaning up, but it has to include trust and consent. Right. And that's the thing. So as me as an individual person, right, I'm not going to consent for anybody to mistreat me. If I say, hey. Here's my suggestion. Here's my point. Here's whatever. We are both equal. So there would be no reason for you to say, well, I'm not going to take that point into suggestion. But the other thing, and we can really talk about, you know, leveling up is, you know, when you go into a business, you should have agreements with people. And those agreements not only talk about, you know, things like, you know, who's going to be doing what and what roles are, but how many hours a week are we going to work together? And when are we going to have meetings? And who's going to be in charge of technology versus who's going to be in charge of finance, right? And so all of those things, I think, too, are areas where you could have, you know, um, uh, areas of potential conflict. You could have areas of difference. But here's where, again, if you've done your work, because, you know, I'm quick to say, well, you know, hey, here's how I'm this and that. So like me asking you every five minutes, do you need anything? You know, uh, do you have anything? You know, because I'm always checking on you because that's my trauma response right. is to make sure everybody else is OK. Because when I was a kid, it wasn't too many people checking for me, especially not when I was home. Right. Um, but to your point, right, around what this feedback look like, what do standards look like? Right. Those things are key, you know. And so when I think about, you know, how to. Um, you know, how to really uh, look at that, right, and, 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 and using it, we want to make sure that we are using standards, right? And that's why we are coming from the standpoint of align, adapt, and accelerate. And we're going to do that not only in how we think about how we're going to, you know, run um, the Center for Intercultural Business Alliances, CFIBA. So thanks, everybody. Take care.